Cool. Thanks very much. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. This is on. Um, first of all, I've got to say I've had that kind of. I've been here since Thursday, and I've had that feeling since Thursday that every presentation just gets better and better. <laughs> and uh, now here I have to give mine. So. Um, First of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm really honoured to be here. It's a real pleasure to kind of be in such a great company with some fantastic speakers and really innovative thinkers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my work, myself, which is always a good place to start, and talk a little bit about um, what it is that I do and the issues that I'm dealing with. Hopefully give you an insight into what I've learned over the last 15 years. Um, and in order to do that, I want to introduce you to someone. Um, I'd like you to meet Victoria, Victoria Obanye. Uh, Victoria was born out outside Lagos in Nigeria, in a small village. She makes the best uh, plantain curries in the world. They are fantastic. Her, her whole family loves her food. Whenever she's cooking, they all come around for miles and miles around, from every village, from every community. They come down to see her, and they want to eat some of her food because they know that it's fantastic. Um, they've been telling her for years that she needs to start, she needs to make this as a business. She needs to not just sell to them or give to them. She needs to start selling and making some money. She knows it's a great idea because she loves cooking, and, but she also knows that she has no money. Her family's poor, her family's poor, uh, sorry, her husband's poor, her family's poor, and she knows that she could borrow some money from a guy who would come round to her house, give her some money, let her start a business. She knows she could borrow some money from a friend of a friend of a friend, but he's also very expensive, so she's a bit worried. Um, and she kind of thinks, well, maybe if it's going to be so expensive, if it's going to be so informal, if it's going to be from the local money lender, Maybe I can't really start that business. Maybe it's just too dangerous. So she is scared. And so she hears about a, an organization in her own community that actually lends money to people who want to start a business or want to use it for something. People like her with no assets. People like her with no, no history in the financial system, no, no bank account in some, some cases. And I met her, um, not in Nigeria, but in Hackney, in Dalston, actually. And the journey to meet Victoria started about 15 years ago. Um, it didn't start straight away. 15 years ago, my, my family's from Bangladesh. And um, about 15 years ago, I was introduced, I was taken to a talk by a guy who'd come over from Bangladesh and said something quite profound. Um, he said that he was empowering women. He said that he was empowering people by lending them small amounts of money. He said something that really kind of resonated with me. And he said, um, the banks were just lending to people who had money. What's the point of that? Why not lend to people who don't have any money? Surely that makes a lot more sense. And I thought, you know what? That actually sounds totally bonkers. Um, <laughs> who's going to lend to someone with no money? So I, um, I wrote him a letter. Um, this is Muhammad Yunus. He's the founder of the Grameen Bank. He's been mentioned once already. And um, actually, he responded. He sent me a letter back and said, look, if you don't believe me, why don't you come out to Bangladesh and have a look? See what's going on. See what we're doing. So I went to Bangladesh. I spent a couple of years there. I, I worked at the Grameen Bank. I, I worked with him, uh, not, not with him directly, but with his team on microfinance um, in the villages all around Bangladesh. I worked at the World Bank. I looked at national microfinance programs. And I tried to understand what was successful about microfinance. Um, if you don't know about it, it's a, it's a model of lending to people who have no assets. It's a model of lending to people to start an idea or a business, or in some cases, just build a roof over their heads. It's an idea that says that just because you have nothing doesn't mean that you're a bad risk. You actually have the opportunity to borrow. Um, and this is a revolution that really over the last 30 years is now serving something like 120 million people around the world. And it really resonated with me that this was just a, not, just a, not just a product or a service. It was a movement. It was a way of thinking about things that was different. And I couldn't help but feel, sitting in the, the roof of a Grameen Bank village office in Mohammedpur in the rural parts of Bangladesh, how similar this experience of finance or lending, this experience of banking was to some of the things that I'd seen growing up in, in a council estate in South London, how similar it was to some of the issues that I'd seen all across London, actually. Now, that might sound strange, because when you think about the United Kingdom, you don't really think about exclusion. You don't really think about people outside the system. What you think about is the credit binge. You think about people with too much access to finance. You think that actually over-indebtedness is the real problem, not financial exclusion. But there is another side of the financial world in the United Kingdom. It's a side of the world for whom the words credit crunch has been a reality nearly all of their lives. These are the 8 or 9 million people who can't access mainstream financial services today. These are the 4 or 5 million people who 
borrow from a guy who comes to your door and offers you cash, finance, legally and legitimately, at about 600% for a small loan, whether that's to buy a school uniform or to pay for some christening presents. These are the one and a half to two million people borrowing from a payday lender who will charge you anything up to two and a half to four and a half thousand percent for a short-term loan in order for you to meet a bill or to pay an immediate cost. These are part of the 1.5 million people in the United Kingdom who currently don't have a bank account, who live in the cash economy. And this is part of the 200,000 people who borrow from somebody who, to be honest with you, it doesn't actually matter what the interest rate is because if you don't repay, they're going to break a leg. Now, it might seem bonkers that these kind of things exist. And these are just some of the interest rates that I see on a regular basis all across London and probably in other parts of the country as well. The interest rates of borrowing small amounts of finance to just meet simple needs, short-term needs. So why do people do this? That's stupid, right? Why would you borrow at 1,000%? Now, who does that, right? Who does that? Are they idiots? Yeah, sure, some people make some bad choices, but, but they're not idiots, actually. Some of them are making strange choices that you and I wouldn't make, but for very good reason. And really, when I was in Bangladesh, this is kind of what really resonated with me. And growing up in England, this is what really resonated with me. These were the same issues. So I think I, they, they boil down to three areas. The first is um, we've s information. We've seen a huge revolution in our retail banking system in the United Kingdom. When my father came from Bangladesh to the UK, maybe 30 or 40% of the population had a bank account. People actually lived in the cash economy in the 60s and 70s. It's no different for them. And what we've seen is that number reduced massively, massively. Like, like to have a bank account is just part of our society. But the way this has happened has been through massive, massive um, use of information, technology, speeding up the processes of making decisions, making it cheaper and easier. But it's also meant that getting into the system has required you to have all that kind of information. If you have a bank account, if you need a bank account, you need a driver's license, passport, or a utility bill. If you don't have those, it gets very hard to even get into the system. Once you're in the system, analysis is based on information. Again, it's based on your credit history. Your credit history determined by home ownership, whether you borrowed already from one of these companies, whether you own a car, whether you have a job. So you can begin to see immediately the people who have difficulty accessing these types of systems. Maybe they've never left the country, don't have a passport. Maybe the bills aren't in their names, they're in their husband's names. Maybe they're paid by the landlord. Maybe they don't own a home. Maybe they work in part-time, short-term self-employment. Maybe they've never borrowed from the mainstream institutions and all of their borrowing is from cash lenders who see them. But in a way, Many people make this choice. They make this choice not because they have to, but because in some ways these products, these services, this, this credit actually meets what they really need. If I sit down and talk to them and ask them, what, what is it that you really want in a financial product? If you talk to any of us, you probably think, well, the number one issue is going to be price. The cheapest product is the one that we get. But time and time again, the same six things come up every time I talk to people. Access and flexibility. Can I even access a product? These are communities where bank branch closures have become a regular site. Is the product flexible? Can it meet my needs? I have a chaotic lifestyle. Well, I have chaotic income. Some months I'm paid, some months I'm not. Sometimes the state decides that I'm not going to be paid this week, but the week after. Can the product meet my needs? Can I, can I miss a payment today and pay tomorrow? The doorstep lender knows where you live. It doesn't matter if you can't pay today, he'll come around tomorrow. He'll come around tomorrow or he'll come around next week. Simplicity. Now, those might... That might sound strange, but simplicity and honesty, those numbers might seem huge and ridiculous. But you know what? A doorstep loan is not 1,000%. It's not 600%. It's actually £20 a week. £20 a week for 50 weeks on a £500 loan. A payday loan isn't 4,500%. It's £30 per month for every £100 you borrow. And that is a simplicity and an honesty that many people don't see in our banking system. When you borrow money and you go into overdraft, suddenly you're stung with a £35 charge you miss a direct debit, like where did that come from? It just doesn't exist and a lot of people find that a lot more straightforward than the mainstream institutions. But, but I think the two most, area, two most important areas are the, are the other one, are the, are the last two and that's time and time again people say to me that they want to be treated with respect. They want the person dealing with them, offering them financial services to treat them with respect, not making judgments about who they are, about what they want to use the money for 
but about treating them with, the, with respect that they deserve. They want to build a relationship with that person. That doorstep lender is not a man with a baseball bat and a Rottweiler. They're probably somebody living in your community who knows what it's like to be poor, who knows what it's like to need access to finance immediately, straight away, and they can help you. That relationship is what really drives them to keep using these services more and more. And in a way, there is a broader issue here, that actually this industry, those seven or eight million people, that number's been pretty consistent for the last 10 years. And that's because this is a monopoly. There are fewer and fewer people playing in this market who are offering access to finance to the excluded. The net result is that the poor get a bad service from the mainstream, because it's just totally inappropriate, or they're not even interested in them, or they get an expensive service from the alternative an expensive service that essentially keeps them outside the system. And I think that this is about a lack of imagination in the products that they serve. These are the same products that have been offered for the last 100 years. Cash loans on your door when you need it. But in a sense, the poor suffer not just a lack of imagination from our service providers or simply the expensiveness of these products. They suffer from a perception problem, a perception that they are too high a risk to develop a new product. They are too high a risk to get a return from in any way, and they are too high a risk to spend any time to start thinking about other types of services. And I think this is what has led to extortionate interest rates, not just here in the UK, but around the world, whether that's in a village in Bangladesh or in England. And I think this is what really, really touched me when I was in Bangladesh. I saw that this, this issue was not just <coughs> where we were, where we were sitting, it was global. But coming back to the United Kingdom, I realised that there is another group in society who needs products like this, who are as underserved by the mainstream as the poor. There is another group in society who requires bespoke, personalised financial services that meet their needs, a respect and a relationship with the person offering them the financial products. And that's the very rich. The only difference is the very rich can afford it, and for the very poor, that cost of that service keeps them poor. And I think microfinance has shown me that there is a way of creating that thing that we've almost lost in the United Kingdom. That human sense of banking, that retail banking where you know your branch manager, that connection with what's going on. And I think that if we could find a way to think, if we could find a way to bring what we can see revolutionising financial services in poor communities around the world back to the United Kingdom, maybe we might be able to develop a new type of financial service here in the UK that is much more inclusive. Um, and this is really what I've been trying to do over the last 10 years. I've been trying to create not just a retail bank, but a private bank. A private bank for the poor. One that actually uses the human touch to break down the barriers to allow people into the system. One that uses the strength of our personal relationships to figure out whether you're risky. Not looking at your assets and making a decision on your past, but on you. Trying to understand whether you're the kind of person who could repay a loan. Using the best computer out there, the human brain, to make those decisions. <laughs> And for the first time, asking people, what do they want as a product? What do they need as a financial service? And redesigning what we think and assume they need to something they actually want. When I came back to the United Kingdom, people told me that this was just a stupid idea. Um, there's no reason that this, this is needed, right? We're, we have a very banked economy. Anyone who needs a financial service can get it if they need it when they want it. And what really surprised me about this was that nobody was willing to take the risk. So I, I, I did this alone to begin with, with a credit card. Started lending on a council estate in Stepney. And now I run an organisation that has successfully proved that you can lend money to people outside the system sustainably and responsibly, get them into the financial services community by lending them small amounts of money in a way that the banks just can't or are uninterested in doing. I've convinced investors that not only is it good for their wallet, but it's good for their heart to put money into an institution like this. And I've shown banks that they can lend through us to get to people that they're completely uninterested in. So I've done this with credit and advice. I've helped countless thousands and will be helping tens of thousands, maybe even millions, over the next few years. But this simple model of thinking about honesty, simplicity, personalization, flexibility, I can use for anything, just about anything, whether that's savings, pensions, insurance, all of the products that we take for granted, that nobody's ever thought about spending the time to find out do the poor not take this because they're poor? Or do they not take it because we don't actually think about what kind of products they want? So why have I done this? Is it because I've seen that there's a market out there that's really interesting that nobody else has touched? Partly. 
Is it because I'm kind of touched by this idea of thinking that social logic and business logic aligned together is the only way that something like this can be successful, possibly? Or is it just that turning all of our preconceived notions about credit worthiness on its head is just, just a hell of a lot of fun? <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> but I think, I think actually there's a bit more. There's a lot more in terms of thinking about what it is that we, we really believe. Um, my, my background is I'm a geographer. I'm not a financier. I've never studied finance in my life. But I get to ask some really interesting questions about finance. And the most interesting one is simply this. What if we could start again? What if we had the chance to recreate our entire financial system in a different way? Would it be like it is today? I think it'd be different. I think it'd be totally different. I think if we can take apart our financial architecture and reconstruct it with the most excluded person in the middle and then recreate it piece by piece, maybe we'd have something completely different. Maybe we would all start to demand that type of service ourselves, that personalized, bespoke nature. Maybe we would all want our financial services determined not on how similar we are to somebody else, but on who we are. Maybe we would like that relationship with the person who manages our money. And maybe we might start asking and demanding changes in the way that we consider or understand the way financial services are delivered in this country and change our conception about what financial services are. Maybe we would want to revolutionize personal finance, not simply to change the way banking is, but to create something that is just much more inclusive and equitable for everybody. Because at the end of the day, that is just a much, much nicer world to live in. And it's the kind of world where someone like Victoria can create probably the finest plantain parlor in the whole of London. Thank you very much.